God's Word, let me invite you to take it out and turn with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. We are, for the next three weeks, going to be looking at snippets from the book of Acts to think about who we are as a church. And we just entitled this series, A Church with a Passion. A Church with a Passion. Webster's Dictionary defines passion as an intense driving or overmastering feeling of conviction. A strong liking or a desire for the devotion to some activity, an object or concept or art, and that word means just passion or enthusiastic affection. Passion means to be intensely focused on something that controls your thoughts, your actions, your convictions. Passion, we might say something like, I eat, sleep, and breathe this. I'm passionate about this. And we think about it in a lot of ways. We might think about passion when a young student throws themselves into music and begins to learn an instrument. They're passionate about the music. They're passionate about learning that hobby. As we go back into school, we might think about a teacher that's passionate about their classroom, about changing the lives of little children and infect, uh, infecting, <laughs> no, that's not the right word these days, affecting the next generation, changing them, moving them. One of the ways in which we talk about passion is we think about sports and sports fans, and we have passion for them. You guys will notice Auburn on the field, War Eagle, by the way. Uh, the idea is, is that we, we might say something like, boy, they're a passionate group of fans, or they're passionate about their sports. Passion is a good thing. It's good to have passion. It's good to have a desire to do something, to put your hand to work, to focus on something. We're not good when we're lazy or without direction or moving along. It's good to have passions. The question is, is as a church, where do we want to focus our passion? Where do we want to put our effort? Where do we want to put our focus? What is our passion? What are we passionate about? about. Every organization has some sort of vision or mission statement. Now, those are slightly different when you look at leadership books and what they mean. And, and really and truly, the vision of any organization, a vision is the final product. What will happen if we follow our mission statement? What will produce on the other end? Visions are never reached. They're always worked for. They're always going after. We don't have to search or make up a vision we have a vision. It comes from the Lord Jesus. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Brothers and sisters, that's the vision of the church. That's been the vision of the church since Jesus said it almost 2,000 years ago. The vision of the church is to go and make disciples. I don't have to go to leadership classes. I don't have to read organizational books. I don't have to figure out snazzy ways to say it. Jesus has said it, go and make disciples. That is the vision of the church. Now, the question is, how do we do that? What's Brushy Creek's unique way? What's our passion for carrying out that vision? How do we focus? What's our mission in order to make disciples? Well, this is how we say it here at Brushy Creek. We say three words, rescue, grow, serve. I want you to say them with me. Let's do it together. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Rescue, grow, serve. My hope is over the next several weeks, you'll get so tired of hearing that, you will say it in your sleep. You will sit up at night and say it. Your wife will say it in the blessing before dinner. Rescue, grow, serve. It will become embedded in you. And the reason for that is because we want to be a church that's passionate about making disciples. And rescue, grow, serve is how we'll focus that passion. Now, what do we mean by these words? Well, we mean simply this. Rescue for us means rescuing the lost. You heard in the song selection today songs such as Rescue the Perishing. Care for the dying. I'll tell you a funny story. As a kid, I thought the word was parachuting. I never understood why the parachuting need rescuing, but I guess it's important, right? Rescue the perishing. Send out the light. Go with the gospel. We believe as a church we are to have a passion for rescuing the lost. Then we move to growing, which is the idea of growing as disciples, growing as believers, and then serve as in serving one another, serving others. And we'll look at those over the next few weeks. But today, I want to start with that first one. I want us to be a church that's passionate about rescuing 
the loss. Now we got to understand two words to understand that phrase. First, the word rescue. The word rescue literally means to show up at the right moment, to pull someone from harm's way at the right moment, to be there in order to alleviate them of the danger they are in or headed for. And the word lost here is a spiritual word. It's a context. It doesn't mean lost like GPS lost. It doesn't mean lost like looking for the address. It doesn't mean lost like Corey in Algebra 2. It doesn't mean that. Laugh a little with me, okay? (laughs) What it means is, it, it is a spiritual word. It means those people, the category of folk, who do not know their eternity is secured in Christ. When we say lost, we mean those who will die and face the judgment of the Lord and be cast from his presence for all eternity because they don't know how to get into heaven. They don't know the kingdom. They don't know the king. They are lost. So when we say a passion for rescuing the lost, we mean this, brothers and sisters. There are people all around us from our neighborhoods to the nations from our kitchen tables to our co-worker break rooms to our schools to our restaurants to all around us that are in desperate need of knowing how they can be saved from the very danger they are facing through death. They need to be rescued. So I want us to be a church that's passionate about rescuing the lost. You know, churches can be known for being passionate about a lot of things. Churches can be known for being passionate about their music or their preaching. They can be known about being passionate about their uh, service ministry. They can be known for being passionate about fighting and arguing. They can be known about being passionate about politics or issues. Listen to me. None of those things are always bad. They're not always wrong. We want to be excellent in our music. We want to be excellent in our preaching. We want to serve other people. But you know what would tickle me to death as your pastor? Is if I'm out and about in the Greenville Taylors area and, and, and I'm walking around and someone comes up to me and says, boy, your church is really passionate about reaching lost people. Well, that would be exciting to hear. I love it when they say, man, the music was great, the the sermon was good. I I love it when they say, man, I love that children's program, man, I love what y'all are doing out there, but I really, really, really wish we'd be a church where they would go, boy, those brushy creakers, they are passionate about rescuing the lost. They want people to know Jesus. That's my heart for us over the next uh, few moments together. Look with me in Acts chapter 1. I want to show you where passion for rescuing the lost comes from. I want to show you where that can be found, and it's in Acts chapter 1, the birth of the church. I'm going to read the first 11 verses, and you follow along there in your copy of God's Word. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given the commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while saying with them, he uh, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John the Baptist baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and not many days from now. I'm at verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood with them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let's pray together, church. Father, this morning, Lord, as we begin to look at our identity as a church, as we begin to look at our focus, uh, Father, there are many wonderful things that our church can do and, and can accomplish, but Lord, we know that the great command is to go and make disciples. That the church is established so that the worship of your people would overflow and go out into the streets and gather up more. 
Lord, we want to be a church that's passionate about rescuing the lost. Father, help us. Help us to have a desire and a, and a want that, that we would go and share the good news of Christ with all that would hear. Lord, help us to be known all around the community as the church who's passionate about rescuing the lost. Lord, give us a passion. Give us a, a conviction, an overwhelming feeling, a, an ardent love for sharing the good news of the gospel. Father, help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Acts, if you are not as familiar with the Bible, the book of Acts is where the story picks up after Jesus has come to earth, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. He's come. He's lived. We find this recorded in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John there in the New Testament. And then he died for sins, and he was buried, and he rose again, and he spent 40 days on the earth after his resurrection to teach, to show, to instruct. And then he ascended into heaven where he is now. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting to return in order to make the final consummation of the kingdom of God. And as he left, he left instructions with his disciples to go and make disciples. Go tell the story of Jesus. Go tell what you've seen and heard, what you've witnessed with your own eyes. Go and share this good news. And so the book of Acts picks up with the story of the disciples going. The picks up right where it left off with the story of the first church. Now the book of Acts is the birth of the church. It's the beginning of the church. Brothers and sisters, when we read the book of Acts, we are reading our heritage. We are reading our history. We are reading where we came from. Brushy Creek is over 200 years old, but it's even older than that. It started in the first century. It began with the book of Acts. It began with the apostles. It began with Peter and Paul. It began with Philip and Matthew and Luke and Timothy. It began with them going and sharing the good news. And the good news spread throughout Jerusalem and Judea. It made its way over to Europe. It found itself on the boats headed to the new country. And now we are a part of the church because they listened to the command to go and make disciples. So when we read the book of Acts, we are reading the very roots of where we came from. And this is important because we want to see what fueled the first church because that will show us where we find our fuel. We go back to the beginning to find the purpose of the church in order that we may know what we should be doing. And in Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 11, we find the church beginning to fulfill what the Lord had given them. We find in this church a passion for rescuing the lost. And there are three parts of this that I want us to see this morning so that we may develop a passion for rescuing the lost. How can you and I get passionate about rescuing lost people? Well, I want to give you three truths this morning to help you with your passion for rescuing the lost. Truth number one, a passion, a passion for rescuing the lost begins with knowing the story. It begins with knowing the story. If you want to have a passion for rescuing lost people, you have to know the story. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 1. The writer here says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, we got to get some clues here. we got to get some context. First of all, we understand that whoever is writing this is writing a second book. They've already written the first one. Because he says in the text... In the first book, O Theophilus, now Theophilus, we believe, is some sort of Roman politician that's being persuaded to the gospel, and so the writer is sending it to it. So the question is, who is the writer? Well, church history will tell us, and the documents of the church will tell us, that the writer of the book of Acts is Luke. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. And so we find that just a few pages before the book of Acts, you find the book entitled Luke. So Luke wrote one of what we call the Gospels, the eyewitness of Jesus. So think about the context here for just a moment. Luke picks up his pen to begin to record the book of Acts. The book of Acts literally means the Acts of the Apostles. What happened after Jesus left? That's, that's what we read in the book of Acts. It's a narrative of what took place. And so what we find in the book is simply this. that We find that, that Luke wrote the book of Luke, the story of Jesus... And then following the story of Jesus, he picks up in the book of Acts what goes on next. And so he says at the very beginning to Theophilus, In the first book, I told you all that Jesus began to do and teach, or teach and do. Now think about this for a moment. Brothers and sisters, 
the fuel for the apostles to go and share the good news, the passion they had for the lost came from Luke's first letter. It came from what Luke wrote the first time. It came from the story of Jesus. In order for us to have a passion for lost people, in order for us to have a passion to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to know the story. We have to know what Luke is talking about. So let's think for just a moment what we would find in the Gospel of Luke. Over in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, you'll find these words spoken to Mary. And behold, you shall conceive and give birth, and his name shall be Jesus, wonderful counselor, prince of peace. We find this early in the book of Luke. Then we move along after Jesus is born in the book of Luke, and we find in the book of Luke in chapter 19, Jesus said, and the Son of Man shall come to see and to save that which was lost. We find not only that Jesus is the Son of God, born of a virgin, born in perfection, living a perfect life, but we find that he came in order to save that which was lost. Then we go on over to the end of the book of Luke, and we will find Jesus on the cross. And the Bible records in the Gospel of Luke, in the 23rd chapter, Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last breath. In the Gospel of Luke, we read about Jesus coming and being born. We read about Jesus seeking to save the lost. We read about Jesus dying on the cross. And then in Luke chapter 24, we read these words. On the first day of the week, early at dawn, they went to the tomb taking spices they had prepared. And they found the stone was rolled away from the tomb. And when they went, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of Luke, we read about a Savior who came from heaven, born of a virgin, born perfectly lived under the law, never sinned. In the Gospel of Luke, we learn that he came to seek and to save those that which were lost. In the Gospel of Luke, we leave, we read that he died on the cross and shed his blood so that we might be saved. And in the Gospel of Luke, we read that on that first day of the week, that Sunday morning, that morning that we gather as the church since the first church began gathering, that day when they went to the tomb expecting to find a dead body, they found no body because in the Gospel of Luke, we learn that Jesus is alive forevermore. It is in the Gospel of Luke that we hear the story of the good news of Christ. It is in the Gospel of Luke that we hear how Jesus came to rescue us. When Luke writes in verse 1, Oh, Theophilus, I've already written to you. He's not just throwing away a sentence in a greeting. He's reminding us that our hope lies in a story. And the story is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Our hope is found in the good news of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our hope is found in a Savior who has come. In the gospel of Luke, we learn the story of Jesus. We learn how he came to save the lost. Might I share with you the gospel for just a moment? Let me remind you the story that we have to tell to the nations. Let me remind you of those that are perishing and what they need to hear. Let me remind you of the light we are called to send out. This is the gospel that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Son of Man, born under the law in order to keep the law, and he kept it perfectly. He kept it with all of its uh, dots and lines. He never broke any part of it. He came in order that his sinless Savior might save sinful people. And the Bible tells us that this Christ, this Savior, this God in the flesh, the God-man who came and walked on this earth bearing the cross went to judgment for you and for me. The book of Galatians would put it this way. He became the curse for us. The Bible will tell us that he, could, that he went and went to the cross. Why? Because he who knew no sin became sin for us. And on the cross he died. And here's what's amazing about the cross. A great exchange takes place. A great exchange on the cross takes place because all of my unrighteousness is laid upon his shoulders and all of his righteousness is given to me. A great exchange which only grace and mercy could do. A great exchange which only the God of love could perform. A great exchange takes place. And there on the cross, by the shedding of the blood, our sins are washed away. Because it is the shedding of blood that brings the remission of sin. And that he's laid in the tomb. A tomb. He died a real death. Buried in a real tomb. A tomb you and I deserve. A tomb. A death that we should have had. And he laid there cold and dead. Not one day. Not two days. But three days. This was no coma. This was no fluke. This was no misdiagnosis. He he was dead for our sins and our trespasses. Oh, but brothers and sisters, 
On that third day, blood began to rush through his veins and his heart began to pump and air began to fill his lungs. And on that third day, he stood up from that tomb and the earth shook and the curtain ripped and the tomb was rolled away and Christ burst forth. And now he says to us, come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. For all who come to this Christ, for all who come to this story, for all who come to him are a new creation in Christ. This is the gospel we find in Luke. This is the story of Jesus. This is what Luke says when he says, we have a story to tell. Oh, brothers and sisters, aren't we good at telling stories? Aren't we good at, as my grandmother would say, spinning yarn? We're good at gathering around and telling stories of our childhood and the weather and what happened last week. We're good at complaining about our ailments and our problems. We're good at explaining the latest article we read or what's happening with our favorite team or what the politicians said right or wrong this week. We're good at discussing the opinions of everything about everything about everything. But listen to me now and don't miss this. We have the greatest story ever told. We hold the greatest story ever told here in our hands. And the world is in desperate need of a good story. The world is in desperate need of the story of Christ. The story that will save them. The story that will rescue them. The story that will bring them back from the pits of hell. The story of the gospel we read in Luke chapter 24 verses 45 and 46. Salvation has come. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture and said to them, Thus it is written, Christ should suffer and on the third day be raised from the dead. We have this story in the Gospel of Luke. I want you to notice a word with me in verse 1. In the first book, Old Theophilus, the story of Christ is what we have. Now notice what he says in verse 1. In the first book, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. You see that word began? The Greek word is arko. It means a continuation. It means something getting started but not finished. Now think about it for just a moment. When we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we talk about a finished work. The gospel of Jesus Christ is finished. Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose from the grave, and once for all died for sin. There is no need for him to die again. There is no need for us to do anything in order to earn our salvation. The seal has been written and sealed in Christ. We are saved by Christ and Christ alone. But here's the interesting thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is finished and unfinished. It is finished in the sense that the way in which the door is open to God is finished because of Christ. But it is unfinished because everybody hadn't heard it. It is unfinished because the story hasn't spread everywhere. It is unfinished because there are millions upon millions of people in the world that do not know the name of Christ. It is unfinished because what does the word say there? Look in your word. It says Jesus began to teach and do. It doesn't say Jesus finished. It says he began. Now if he began it, who's supposed to be finishing it? That's us. That's the church. We are to pick up the mantle and take the story. We are to pick up the mantle and take the message. We are to pick up the mantle and proclaim it to the nations. We are to pick up the mantle and preach the forgiveness of sinners. There is a world in desperate need of a story. Let me give you an interesting illustration. On May the 12th, 1865, one month and three days after the surrender of Robert E. Lee at the courthouse of Appomattox, one month and three days after the southern states surrendered, there was a battle in Texas. It was called the Battle of Palomino. And in the Battle of Palomino, five soldiers were killed, 20 were wounded, and 150 southern soldiers were captured. One month after the war was over, if they had only heard the news, if they had only gotten the story, if it had only had gotten to them. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. We have a story to tell, and there are people dying every day that it hasn't reached. There are people every day being held captive by Satan. There are people every day thinking the war is still going on and they have not heard the story. But if you and I will have a passion for rescuing the lost and take the story of Christ, we can tell those soldiers, lay down your weapons, the battle is over. We can tell them of the story. A passion for rescuing the lost is by knowing the story. Number two... Having a passion for rescuing a loss not only means knowing the story, it means following the command. Look with me at the next part of the verses. We pick up in verse 2 where Luke continues to describe what's been happening. 
in the text. He says in verse 2, Until the day when he was taken up, after he had given the commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while they were staying there with him, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. So he's given the disciples a command, wait for me in Jerusalem. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now look at verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, you, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Is now the time you're going to take over, right? You're going to overthrow Rome. That's what they're asking. Notice what Jesus says. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now I want you to look in your Bible at Acts 1.8. If you have a pen or a pencil, I invite you to underline it, star it, highlight it, circle it. If you're adverse to writing in your Bible, get over it, underline it, circle it, star it, highlight it, right? Acts 1.8, you will receive power when my spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now notice what Jesus doesn't do. They ask a question about the times. Lord, are we supposed to overthrow Rome now? Are we supposed to do this or that? Lord, how are we supposed to work in the political realm? How are we supposed to work in the social realm? Lord, is now the time we're to start laying bricks for the new palace that you're going to live in? And notice they have all of these questions about all of these subjects. And Jesus drills down and says, nope, I got one thing for you to do. I got one command I want you to Don't worry about the time. Don't worry about the kingdom. Don't worry about the palaces. Don't worry about Rome. Don't worry about the politics. I got one thing I want you to do. Be my witnesses. Be my witnesses. Now notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say be a preacher, right? We're not all called to that. It doesn't say be a Sunday school teacher. We're not all called to that. But he's speaking to every person who's come to the Lord Jesus. When you come to the Lord Jesus, you, give the, you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, so every believer who's come to the Lord Jesus that has the Holy Spirit has one task that they are going to be required to answer for when they stand before the Lord, be my witnesses. One task. What's interesting to me is oftentimes, brothers and sisters, in our walk with the Lord, we make it really, really complicated. Oh, I'm looking for God's will. I'm not sure what the Lord wants me to do. Oh, I'm just praying about it. I'm just looking for it. Listen, I understand there are decisions that are unique to each one of us, and we need to seek the Lord's will, and we need to pray. But the decision to tell people about Jesus is not something to pray about. It's a command directly from Jesus. If you want to know where God stands on telling people about him, he's for it. He says in the text, be my witnesses. Go and tell. So the only qualification here is you must know the Lord and have the Holy Spirit. So when you know the Lord as your Lord and Savior, you are given the Holy Spirit, and therefore you meet the requirements as a believer. So if you're here today and you say, I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am saved, the Holy Spirit resides inside of me, then you are commanded to be a witness. And I want you to see something really neat about this. Because the Lord does two things in this one verse that is so helpful to us. One, he tells us where the power comes from. I'm so thankful for this. Look what he says. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He doesn't say you need to study hard to figure out how to say all the big words in the Bible. He doesn't say don't witness till you can pronounce propitiation and define it, right? He doesn't say that. He says here's what you need to know. Know the story, verse 1. Know the gospel. Be saved. And verse 2, rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. People often say to me, Pastor, I'm just not good with words. I don't know about witnessing. What if I mess up? Can I let you in on a secret? If the person you're sharing with is lost, you ain't going to make them more lost. They're lost. They're lo it's kind of like this. If you see me fall over dying and you say, well, I'm not a doctor, then kick me. Maybe that'll help. Do something, right? So he says, be my witness. So the power comes from the Lord. He is giving you the strength to share the good news. He is the one who provides the power. But notice what else he does. 
Not only does he provide the power, and we see this even in the book of Acts. You go just a few chapters over to Acts chapter 4. The Bible says, and Peter was filled with the Spirit and began to preach. God met him where he needed to be to share the words that needed to be shared. But I want you to see something else from the verse. Not only does he give us power, he gives us a plan. You might say, well, I don't know where to start. How do I witness? Where do I go? I'll I'll help you here. Look at verse 8 again. He says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know what's interesting about that verse? There is no category where you get to hide. There is no territory. He doesn't say you'll be my witnesses except for Greenville, South Carolina. That's not what he says. You get to be my witnesses except you don't have to do it at home in your family. You get to be my witnesses but works off limits. You don't have to do it there. That's not what he says. He says be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Now for the disciples, that's the town they're in. That's their address. That's their home. That's where they've planted a flag. Then he says, let's make it bigger. Let's do Jerusalem. Let's do Judea. Let's do Samaria. Let's do the county and the state and the region. And just to be clear, so that he makes sure he covers every part of the blanket, he says, and to the ends of the earth, or until all time, everywhere, always. So you ask yourself, well, pastor, where do I start? Wherever you are. Wherever you are. Mom and dad, start with your children. Children, start with your parents. Start with your neighbor, your cousin. Start with your coworker. Start with the young lady you're stuck in line with at the DMV because you're going to be there a while. Start somewhere. Start everywhere. Because the church is to be a people who share the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere. I like to say it this way. From the neighborhood to the nations. Everywhere we go, we want to share the good news of Christ. Why? Because everywhere we go, there are people in desperate need of hearing the story and being rescued. They need to be saved. You know what's interesting? If you're here this morning and you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because somebody told you about Jesus. Somebody shared with you the story. It might have been a radio program you tuned into. It might have been a TV preacher you heard. It might have been your mother, your grandmother. It might have been a Sunday school teacher. It might have been an RA leader. It might have been on a mission trip. But somebody told you about Jesus. Why? Because salvation comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Somebody told you about Jesus. There is a famous saying that is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, and it says, um, at all times witness, and if necessary, use words. That's a dumb statement. I mean, I understand the concept of we should live a life that's morally matching the gospel. We should live a life that shows we've been changed. But I understand the concept that our lives should be a witness of the goodness of God. But ain't nobody getting saved by watching me cut my grass with a good attitude. You're definitely not getting saved watching me yell at my kids. I know that. That's not how people get saved. That would be like me saying, hey, feed the hungry in Africa and if necessary, use food. Right? It doesn't make sense. We are called to share the story. So many of us are paralyzed in witnessing because we say things like, well, I'm just living a good example. There's a lot of good example people in hell, brothers and sisters. The difference is the story of Jesus. I'm going to invite Aaron Campbell up on the stage now. Aaron, would you come join me? Aaron is a part of our Brushy Creek family, her and her husband, Eric. And just a few weeks ago, Erin had the opportunity to lead someone to the Lord. And I've asked her to share with you how she did that. Thank you, Erin. Good morning. So um, this past spring, I uh, became really convicted about the number of gospel conversations that I wasn't having. Particularly after I learned about a group of my college students that were uh, taking the commands of Christ very seriously. And they were going out consistently on a weekly basis and sharing Christ with um, anybody they met in in an apartment complex nearby. And so um, I asked if I could start going out with them and um, just, yeah, just wanted to go out and be part of of what they were doing. And uh, the second week that we were out there, I met a lady whom I'll refer to as Dee Dee. And um, we asked Dee Dee, how can we pray for you? And she started, she was a little hesitant at first, understandably, but she, she shared with us that she was a single mom, three kids, and she had a very young child that was facing a serious medical procedure. And so um, Dee Dee allowed us to pray with her, but also to share the gospel. And um, she expressed interest in hearing more. And so I asked her, hey, is it okay if we come back the next week? 
And she said that would be all right. So me and a student went back and we took her a Bible and well, we got to chat with her a little bit. And so that kind of started a, a pattern of, of trying to go and see her weekly. And some weeks we made plans and they fell through and then other weeks it panned out, and, but it would only be like a 15 minute conversation. Um, it was several weeks before Dee Dee would allow me to, to come inside her home and sit with her for a little bit. But when that happened, it, our friendship really started to take off and as we got to know each other better, she started to open up more and more about her struggles and it really allowed me to just share about salvation and God's grace and how Jesus is the only one that could ever really meet her in the deepest needs of her heart. And so throughout the course of that, you know, we got to, to know each other and just continue to, to meet with her and pray with her and just continue to, to share the, the good news of Christ. And so about a month ago, uh, Dee Dee made the decision that she wanted to trust Christ for salvation and and trust him to lead her in the days to come. And so since then, we've been meeting together to read scripture, and it's a slow process, I'll be honest, but God's hand of grace and faithfulness has been so evident in this um, because I've, I've seen her as she's grown the last six months, um, just in her willingness to talk about this more and, and think about it more, and then her decision to trust him. And so, um, it's just very clear that, that he, is, he is working, and, and even in the midst of our weaknesses, uh, he will use us for his, his purposes. So if you think about it, I would appreciate your prayers for Dee Dee as she continues to learn what, what this means for her to be in new life in Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's rejoice in that this morning, church family. Amen. I love the way Aaron said, I was convicted over my lack of gospel conversations. We have a story to tell and a command to follow. D.T. Niles said that witnessing is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That's what we are. We found the bread of life, and we want to tell someone else. Let me show you one final truth about how to have a passion for rescuing the lost. Following the story, or knowing the story, following the command, and a passion for rescuing the cost comes from understanding the times. Would you look with me at verses 9, 10, and 11 here? As we finish this challenge, look at verse 9. And when he had said these things, remember Luke is recounting what happened on Jesus' last day with the disciples. And when he said these things, they were looking, as they were looking, he was lifted up into the cloud. This is the ascension we find at the end of the Gospels. He's gone back to heaven now, up in the clouds. And verse 10, and while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them with white robes. These are angels of the Lord. And said, men of Galilee, talking to the disciples, Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus was taken up from you into heaven, and he will come again in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, I want to press you for just a moment, brothers and sisters. I want to to pull at your heart for just a moment. We find in the first part of it a a message to tell, the story of Jesus. We find in this that the messengers are us, Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses is what the Lord tells us. But finally here we find a motivation. And the motivation is simply this. The clock is ticking. Time is running out. The Lord Jesus ascended unto heaven and the disciples were staring into the cloud aimlessly when the angel of the Lord said, what are you doing? Why are you staring at the clouds? He's coming back. And he will come back the same way. The sky will split and the Lord will return and the clock will end and there'll be no more opportunities to come to Christ. Judgment will fall. So for you and I to have a passion for the gospel, we must understand the times that any moment, at any time, the trumpet can sound, the sky will split, the Lord will come back. And yes, those of us that are in Christ, we will rejoice and be thankful. But those of us that do not know the Lord, that have not heard the story, they will be cast forever into the damnation of hell. Brothers and sisters, we must know the times. Time is running out. And your neighbor needs to hear the story. Your spouse, your children, your co-worker, the nations need to hear the story. They need to know of Christ. And the Lord has commanded us to go. I, I don't understand why. I think to myself, man, God could line the stars up with John 3.16 and everybody could read it at once. He could cause the whales to jump out of the ocean, stand on their head and sing the gospel if he wanted to. 
I don't know why he does it this way, but he's chosen to invite us, his people, into his plan. He's chosen to take Moses, who was terrible at speech, or David, who was a runt, or Peter, who was an uneducated fisherman, or Zacchaeus, a swindling tax collector, or the woman at the well who was marked with a scarlet letter, or the ladies at the tomb who no one would listen to. He chose to take those that have been touched by grace and send them with the story. But think about it. Who better to tell the story than those who've met Jesus? Who better to tell the story of grace than those who've experienced the grace of God? Brothers and sisters, the time is running out. Jesus said, In John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I am coming again so that you may be where I am also. Jesus is coming again, and no man knows the hour. The time is running out. We have to, we have to, brothers and sisters, stop staring at the clouds and start sharing the word of the Lord. We have to stop staring at the clouds and start proclaiming Jesus Christ. C.T. Studd said it this way. He said, Let us not glide through this world and then slip quietly into heaven without having blown the trumpet loud and long for our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Let us see that the devil will hold a thanksgiving service in hell when he gets the news of our departure from the field of battle. Oh, brothers and sisters, I hope when I leave this world, Satan sighs and is thankful that I'm no longer in the battle. That we would tell people the story. I want to ask you a question. Who have you told of Jesus? Who have you told of the grace of Christ? Who have you shared the good news with? Acts 1.8 says you are to be a witness. Brothers and sisters, let us obey the commandment. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, we want to be a church that's passionate about the lost. We thank you even now for Dede who's given her life to Christ. And we thank you that you used Aaron to do that. Well, what a privilege it is. You didn't have to use Aaron, but you did. What a privilege it is to be people who get to share the good news of Christ. Lord God, I pray you would press on our hearts that we would share this gospel. That we would share this good news. That we would have a passion for lost people. God, we want to be known as a church that's rescuing the lost. We're thankful for all the things that we have, but Lord, the commandment is to be a witness. That's the, that's the line in the sand. That's what you've called us to do. Help us to be witnesses. Father, even now I pray that you would, as I'm praying, you would place on the heart and mind of everyone in this room someone they can share the gospel with. That you would order their steps and orchestrate their week. They would cross paths with people and share the good news. Brother, sister, in just a moment, I'm going to stand and say amen and we're going to sing. There's an opportunity. Maybe you want to come this morning to this altar and say, Lord, give me a passion to share the good news. Maybe you want to come and pray for someone that needs to hear it. Billy Graham would often say, how can I talk to someone about God if I haven't talked to God about them? Maybe you want to come pray for them, that they would hear the good news today. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, you know, you've talked about Jesus, His death, His burial, His resurrection, His salvation. You've talked about time running out. You've talked about the world coming to an end. And and I'm just not sure if I'm ready. I need to know this Jesus. Then, brother, sister, today is the day of salvation. Now you can be saved. And we would rejoice with you. Whatever you need to do, I pray that you'll leave this place asking the Lord to give you a passion to rescue the lost. God, lead us now as we have to respond to your word. We've heard your word. We have to respond. There's there's no indifference here, Lord. It's either obey or disobey, so help us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?